start off by introducing ourselves, like, who are you, what do you do, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Like I said, I'm Adrian Alonzo, and I'm doing this because I'm part, I go to UMD, I'm an animal science major, and I'm part of Dr. Burke's horse management course, and so one of her assignments for this semester was to get in contact with someone in the horse industry just to learn more about potential job opportunities, and uh, my dogs are coming in now. <laughs> <laughs> potential job opportunities and you know ways that we can go into the horse industry because a lot of people just think oh it's only like horseback riding or only this but there's a lot more and so I chose to research you because I thought your job seemed interesting so okay. can you tell me about your job? Yeah so <laughs> my name is Erin um, Ochoa and I'm the CEO at Dazen Farm Horse Rescue. I've been there for 15 years uh, so for you know quite a long time now it seems <laughs> um, I started out, uh, I was actually lucky to start out in the program side of it. So I, I came in as basically a farm manager and it really allowed me to have a lot of perspective over my position now because I definitely understand what it takes to be in the trenches of the organization from the day-to-day -day management of the horses. Um, and, you know, basically for what day's end is, is we um, bring in horses who have been neglected and abused throughout the state of Maryland, but also, you know, surrounding states as well, um, where animal control goes out, they, they may have a, a concern or a, a complaint call that would come in from the community. They would go out and primarily their job is to educate and try to help keep the horses in place. But when those um, efforts don't happen, unfortunately, the horses have to be seized. And because most of our animal control facilities have sheltering for cats and dogs, they don't necessarily have sheltering for horses and or the expertise to handle, you know, large animals like that. So Days End 30 years ago really, you know, became about because there was this, you know, uh, lingering problem of horses really not having a place to go. And that's, that was how it was founded. Um, and so we, basically help facilitate that rehabilitation process and help hold the horses um, in the, the county's custody, but at our facility until at which time they go to, to court and a judge can decide on the total outcome of the case. Most of the time the horses um, are uh, relinquished and um, the county um, chooses to go ahead and, and sign them over to Days End to facilitate the finishing up of their rehabilitation and then potentially retraining them. Um, so they can go on to either be, you know, show horses or they can just go on to be great companion horses if they're not rideable. Um, and so our success rate is 96% um, of our horses that come in are able to be rehabilitated. And we are able, we have a huge, you know, success rate with adoption. So getting them rehomed is, you know, is, is the primary goal. So it's, it's a great, a lot of people always ask me, like, how could you work there? It seems like it'd be so depressing, but you really are so inspired by the, the, the will of a horse, the trust of a horse, you know, especially when they come in in these neglectful situations that they're able to be so receptive to our help and to allow us, you know, into their lives. And you watch that transformation, both physically and mentally and getting to see them then go off and have a new life um, is great. And, you know, some of the, the, you know, cases that stick with you are, you know, the horses who've been locked up for 10 years in a stall and, you know, getting to see grass for the first time. So those are really satisfying moments um, that I enjoy. So, you know, when I started, it was definitely an eye opener for me because I grew up in the uh, horse show community and did dressage and like that was the world I knew and never really understood that there was like abuse and neglect out there. Um, and, and that was probably be mostly because it's like the day and age for me, you know, coming up like social media wasn't a thing, you know, well, it wasn't something that, you know, is like my daughter right now is, you know, inundated, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok or, you know, whatever she's on, uh, she, you know, is, is constantly inundated with what's going on in the world where, you know, you really didn't have that when I was younger. So, so I trans, I transitioned over time as our founder um, decided to step back and retire. The board of directors went ahead and uh, put me in the position as the CEO of the organization. So my job significantly changed. <laughs> How long have you been the CEO for? Um, I've been the CEO for six years. Uh, so, and it probably about two years prior to that, I was able to work as the assistant executive director at the time and sort of 
start to transition into that role and get a better understanding of what was going to be required. So it was kind of, it wasn't a, you know, sudden transition for me when I finally, you know, stepped in and our founder decided to, to leave. And she, unfortunately, she left due to health issues. So she wasn't able to continue with the organization in any capacity, but um, definitely like so admire the commitment that it takes someone to start a nonprofit and to like actually make them succeed. Um, it, the statistic is actually 70% of horse rescues fail within the first three years of starting. So it's very, you know, it, it's a lot of, of blood, sweat and tears personally for whoever takes on that endeavor. So I was kind of lucky to get to step into it, you know, when it was, it was so much more well-established and had a lot of uh, supporters. So with the CEO position, what does a day in, what does like a normal day at your job look like? I don't know if there's a normal day with any animal job, but. <laughs> um, so, you know, primarily I spend, I do spend a lot of time in meetings, unfortunately, but it's, you know, a lot of, so it's a lot of, of leadership, making decisions, um, making sure that the organization is headed in the right direction. So, you know, I'm kind of like the uh, captain of the ship and my team is executing everything and making sure that everything happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I sort of make sure that, you know, the funding is in place, you know, monitor the budget, um, help keep, you know, the strategic direction in line. So my board of directors, what they do is sort of set the path for the ship. They tell me where I'm going and it's my job to make sure that we're getting there. And the board of directors is my boss. And so um, you know, I basically then disseminate out that vision and, and make sure everything on a day to day happens. So definitely um, financial management. So sorry. <laughs> it's totally okay. I'm like one FedEx truck going up my driveway before my dog goes, you know, off crazy anyhow. So I totally get it. <laughs> it's the life of Zoom right now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So you know, on a day to day. Um, you know, again, it's it's fiscal management and, you know, meeting with the team and making sure that everything's going well. I do, you know, get involved in uh, incoming cases that, you know, we may be getting, um, participate in, you know, if we're uh, fundraising, definitely, you know, trying to help raise money to keep everything going. Uh, it's pretty much a day-to-day -day thing. All right. And did yeah. your job require any special training? Like when you first got there, did you have to have a special degree or did you need to get one as you were promoted or how did that work? Yeah, so the, I didn't, I wouldn't have needed necessarily a degree coming into it. I, I envisioned myself starting my own nonprofit, which is very unique, you know, how I came to day's end. I went and, you know, I had, my schooling was more in psychology and education, but I had grown up in the horse field. I worked at a mixed animal practice um, while I was in between college classes just to help earn funding. Uh, and you know, I was married and we were building a house and I decided, oh, I'm gonna start a nonprofit here at our you know, 14 acre farm at and do therapeutic riding and got certified to do that through PATH and started my own nonprofit. I, I did my articles of incorporation. I you know, filed for my uh, nonprofit status, everything was in place. But I realized that it takes a lot of work and a lot of people to actually help get a nonprofit going. And so I said, well, let me let me take this job at day's end just to help supplement our income and pay the mortgage. And within three months of working there, it was like the perfect storm of like everything that I was interested in of, you know, people and education and then also the, the veterinarian side and the care of animals. And so I just kind of decided not to go forward with that um, endeavor and just ended up staying at day's end um, and growing there. But what was super helpful is when the board of directors decided to bring me on, they said, well, we need to, she's not, she's not been a CEO or executive director before. So we need to you know, give her enough tools to support her in that. And so I went to the University of Baltimore and did a 18 month um, uh, certification in public management. And it was really helpful because it really gave me more perspective on like program evaluation and fiscal accountability and things like that. So um, it was a it was a really nice program. It was a cohort of other people that were in the nonprofit sector. So it was nice hearing about other, you know, people that were in the same profession and what they were dealing with or 
um, looking at nonprofits of different sizes and being able to compare sort of how people were successfully executing marketing plans or, you know, things like that. So I definitely think the other key is continuing education. Like you, you can never, one of, I had a mentor that once said like, as a CEO, you should spend 15% of your time just reading, researching, and, you know, making sure that you're on top of industry trends and self-development because you never want to become stagnant as a leader because you're always trying to move the organization forward and you don't want it to get stuck. And if you're not constantly, you know, being creative and evolving yourself, then you kind of aren't helping the organization get where it needs to go. Constantly learning is something that yeah. I'm obviously <laughs> learning. Yeah. Yeah. It seems just how life is. You're always learning. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to, I'm reading through like a list of questions that I have. Um, so what might be the starting salary range for when you first started versus where you are now? It's so like five, 10, five, 10 years ago to now. Well, I can't even remember. It's, what I, what I will say to help to clarify that question is we currently get paid way under industry standards. So <laughs> most of my directors uh, that are at the highest level of the organization are in the 40s range. And that's like, you know, I comparatively, you know, hiring in an executive person to, to run teams and to manage, you know, the budgets that we have, you know, I, I'm so blessed that I have people that are willing to take to take the salary. Our barn staff starts in the eleven to twelve dollar range, and so I'm chasing this problem of um, the minimum the minimum wage is continuing to raise in Maryland. I think through 2024, and so I'm constantly having to continue to figure out how to raise more funding for our you know salaries, and that's like a weird thing for for me as the CEO is is that in essence, like you're raising all this money for your mission and your, the horses and the, but you're also raising money to, so I can get paid, you know, <laughs> this is, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's a job. Um, and if you look at the nonprofit industry, you know, so much, so much criticism comes on paying people, not putting that money towards, but you know, I, I need to ensure that somebody's going to show up and feed these horses and wrap the horse's legs and, you know, you know, make sure that they, they get cared for. And that always isn't as reliable when you have a volunteer force. They're, they're amazing and they supplement, but there's no true accountability to, hey, you're not feeling that great today, but, you know, you've got to come in, you've got to, you've got to do what you need to do. So I think that, nonprofits in order for them to continue to stay competitive against the for-profit sector because really it's this it's you have to have intelligent people running these nonprofits and helping elevate them and help make sure that they become successful have longevity um, so the more professionalized the nonprofit industry continues to become I think the the more talent that they'll be able to attract so in short, below industry standard, unfortunately, is the life, at least at day's end. The dog came in. I'm gonna close the door again. Okay. I got two basset hounds and they like to just wander, so. Yeah. I'm doing my best here. <laughs> okay. All right, so, yeah, below the industry standard, okay. Um, <clears throat> ooh. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, um, what is the most challenging part about your job? Like you mentioned how you struggle with funding and with trying to like organize all the wages, but it, like, what else would be challenging? Well, on that same, same sort of thread, every time you're fundraising and you hit your goal, the next day you wake up and you're always starting over, right? So it's like, okay, you're trying to raise a hundred dollars and you raise it and then it starts all over because you still need the next day you need another hundred dollars. And so that can, you know, you're in this sort of gerbil wheel of constantly doing the same sort of striving to, to be able to fund your mission. Um, the, the unknown right now, I mean, considering the time frame that we're in the unknownness about what tomorrow will bring, you know, whether that's having to shift, we've had to shift, you know, all of our programs lately, I haven't been able to be on site. So shifting, 
things. Um, we haven't had to open, we haven't been able to open up our volunteers um, fully. So we've had to readjust and be become more efficient in how we do our day to day jobs in order to not let the mission um, deter. So I've always been one that sort of can see where we're going. And I will say like during the last, you know, six to seven months, that's been a little bit more challenging because it's like, I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. <laughs> you know, I, I never thought we'd still be sitting here like this, this, you know, I was like, oh, a couple of weeks, we'll be back to normal. Um, so that can always be a challenge. And then anytime you're managing teams and, you know, the horse industry, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, especially in the rescue industry, it's a lot of women. And so I have a team of 19 women that are, you know, under me and that can always sometimes, you know, present it's ups and downs, but <laughs> the most part, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you see is something good about you? Like what's the, what would you say is the best part about your job? Aside from every, all the struggle. It with back, yeah, it goes right back to the the team I mean gosh to be able to work with such passionate and amazing you know people I think definitely is is something that that the horses are always like the constant right there's always that fulfillment that you get but if you don't have good people around you that are working with you it doesn't matter how good what you're doing is it's it's just not as worth it so um I do try to surround my people, people put people around me who have good energy, who complement my and offset my what my weaknesses. So you know, I I might not be the person who like loves to to go to a social event and be like the you know, life of the party. I can I can put on a smile, but I don't get energy from that. So I try to put people under me who like love that because then it offsets sort of, you know, those qualities. So I, I will say the best part is the team and then the horses for sure. I mean, to be able to work in the horse industry and, you know, before I came to day's end, I, you know, I did some office work. I worked in the mortgage industry for a while and did sales with, you know, selling mortgages and there's, I mean, that's like a whole other like thing. So the fact that you get to like do this and still be around horses every day is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so what sort of education and outreach does your team perform to try and educate or prevent horse neglect and abuse? What's really neat about Day's End, um, and I really admire the wherever this, the seed of this thought came from 30 years ago, which was to to appeal and be for the public, for beginners, because the horse industry can actually feel really intimidating sometimes for people who are brand new to it, because it's like, it, it is kind of an exclusive club to get into. Um, it can be intimidating, you know, working around horses. Um, so our organization is what you would call a point of entry place. So we, we allow beginners to come in to day's end. And that's, that's, you know, very unique. You, you know, most horse rescues, because they don't have that philosophy or the um, ability to manage groups like that, they're looking for people who have experience because that makes sense. Like they, they want people who they don't have to train to lead a horse or to groom. They want people to come in and actually help them get their day to day done. Mm -hmm. But Day's End really believes that the more people we can expose to horses, that ultimately you're going to change the culture and compassion for animal welfare, you know, people being able to come in and, you know, the horse being the draw, you know, coming to day's end and then, you know, learning and taking that back out into their community. So we're, we're not the final destination for a lot of our volunteers. And we bring 1200 volunteers in a year, in a normal year. <laughs> um, of that number, about three to 400 of that 1200 are our steadies, like help us, you know, make sure that they're getting the day to day done. But a lot of the 1200 are, you know, they come in and they maybe they do under 10 hours or they come in with a, a group and, you know, do a half a day. And so we always make sure that education is a part of everything that we do from, you know, being open for tours every single day to the public from nine to four um, and allowing anybody just to drive up you know, into our farm and learn more about what we do. And they get to see what's happening in that snapshot of time, regardless of whether it's, you know, 12 horses that just came in or it's the trainers down at the ring, you know, training horses. Um, so always trying to figure out ways in which to draw the public. And 
part of our next five year expansion plan is really devoted into that piece of agro-tourism where you're, you're engaging the public and the community to understand more about the equine industry and really excited about that and looking at to take the approach of of humane education in which I think is a really cool new emerging field that I'm hearing a lot more about. Um, and it's it's looking at everything in, in a more holistic manner. So being able to appeal to more community groups to come in. So it might be a group that's coming in and they're gonna they're gonna do a project where they're gonna learn about you know water runoff and how that affects our and impacts our land and our our horses or how bees, if we don't have them and we don't figure out how to, to incorporate in proper environments for them at our farm, we don't get hay at the end of the day. We need these other elements and these other pieces in our environment. And so really trying to use the horse as sort of the center of that puzzle and then really educating and highlighting uh, around that. And I think that's gonna be a really neat thing. So we're envisioning, um, having a welcome center so that it would be the start of tours that would have a lot of educational components and then incorporating a lot of these elements through our farm um, and really being able to show people hands-on, you know, the transformations that the horses are making there, but also um, how they can take little things back into their own backyards and incorporate a more healthy environment for us all. Sounds really nice. It's really good. Sounds really exciting. Um, so you mentioned that your horses often get adopted or um, put else, um, taken elsewhere. There's a lot of success. So what does the adoption process look like? Yeah, so one, you know, every rescue is sort of different. Some, some have a hybrid model of it. We don't have any horses, except we have a handful of resident horses that are there strictly for educational purposes. And it's actually a really unique job because our farm operates very much like a shelter in the sense that everybody is up for adoption once they're once they're able to be. Um, so we don't sanctuary any animals at our at our facility, and a shelter can be a really stressful environment for certainly cats and dogs. But you know we're lucky that we can give horses a more um, shelter experience, it's a more natural environment for them. So once they're healthy enough, they get introduced and they go out into herds and they're, you know, with with other, you know, horses and they're in fields. But that can be really stressful in a shelter environment for horses too, because the herd dynamic is always changing. And, you know, a horse gets adopted out and that whole herd structure changes for them. And, and we're adopting out sometimes four or five horses a week. And so our goal is to always get them through the pro rehabilitation process, through training and evaluation, whatever that looks like, um, and then get them into the adoption um, program. And once once they sort of go through the, re the physical rehab, our trainers take them and they evaluate them to see where, where they are in their, their training. Because we don't know anything about these horses when they come in. So it's not like we're getting to go to even even rescues who go to auction and are able to pull horses. They they might have a little bit more of an idea, at least of if the horse has you know been haltered before. Um, so our trainers you know deal a lot with horses that haven't been touched and having you know which they actually prefer those because they don't have a lot of bad habits <laughs> uh, to to trade out of them. But you know sometimes we get in horses who had been previously raced or they had been show horses and so they evaluate them and figure out sort of what their needs are. And then they put them into a training regimen based on that. And that might last anywhere from three to six months, depending on what the horse's needs are. And then for adoptions, most people uh, learn about our horses via our website um, or our social media channels if we post something. And they submit an inquiry form expressing their interests. And it tells our trainers just a little bit about who they're looking at and what they're looking for. And then our trainers will give them a call and they'll, they'll have a conversation over the phone just to make sure um, that, you know, it's it, it seems like it's going to be something that they're interested in coming out and taking a, a closer look at. We do two to three appointments, depending on whether the horse is rideable or not rideable. Um, so the first appointment is really a sort of they meet and know. Um, 
get to know the horses a little bit better. You know, maybe they'll go out and you know catch them in the field, groom them. If, you know, if they're riding, maybe they'll go ahead and see the trainer ride. They'll get on the ride, and then they, if they are continuing to be interested, they'll come back out for either a, another appointment. Sometimes they'll have their vet come out and do a pre-purchase exam if they, you know, it's something that that's something they're interested in doing. Um, we're definitely not into selling horses that's for sure because we don't want them to come back because as a safety net they're always able to come back to day's end regardless so if they've ever been a day's end horse or have come through our program and it doesn't work out the owner has the option of sending them back if they want to um, and we've had horses that have been out for 20 years and the you know they don't feel like you know rehoming them themselves and so they'll send them back to day's end uh, which is always an option so because of that we want to make sure it's a really good match because the last thing we want to do is just have unsatisfied adopters um, so we really put a lot of thought into helping support the adopter make the make the right decision for what's going to work for them um, but then our trainers provide ongoing support whether that's phone calls or they you know need to go out and you know if, if somebody's having a little bit of an issue with their horse they'll they'll sometimes they'll go and help the adopter so i think what's really cool when you go through a, an adoption partnership like days and has with our adopters you're really like developing a um a lifelong support system for you and for your horse and i think that's you know something that we really value yeah. So you mentioned being like an entry point. Do you get a lot of first-time adopters, like first-time horse owners where you adopt people are adopting? And what sort of advice would you give to new horse owners to make sure that they don't end up back in uh, rehabilitation? Yeah. Um, we do. We we encourage first-time adopters to figure out more of a support system than just day's end. So we prefer that they are working with a trainer or taking lessons. And you know, we we encourage them to board their horses for the first year if they can, if you know it's something that they already have a farm that they've purchased and they're looking to put horses on. Then we really talk to them about what support systems they're gonna put in place because inevitably if you're first time horse owner, you're gonna have questions or you're gonna need it, you know, that community of people who are like, oh yeah, you should, you should try this or um it's it's just something that we really think it really is helpful for people. And so a lot of times for first time, first time horse owners, they'll bring their, their person that's giving them lessons out with them or they'll bring their trainer um, with them. So that I think is super helpful for first time horse owners. We also encourage them to come volunteer. Um, I think that getting your hands on as many horses as possible is super helpful because you learn to read horse body language faster than just, you know, having one horse to develop a relationship with. And so volunteering often gives people a huge perspective on how much work goes into caring for horses, you know, what's entailed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and sometimes it it actually hits the mark enough that people are just like, I'm just gonna continue to volunteer and like just enjoy all these horses that are here. And sometimes it prepares them better to really fully make that commitment into horse ownership. So with, um, you mentioned you get a bunch of volunteers every year or new hires, is that, is the application process like grueling? Is it difficult to actually get get into the um, to the program? I guess. So for volunteering, we offer, and again, we'll pretend this is a normal world. We offer two orientations a month um, uh, on the second Saturday and the fourth Thursday. And sometimes our Saturday orientations will have like upwards of 150 people come to them. Um, now sometimes it's because we allow we allow kids to volunteer at day's end. Um, so if kids are five or older, uh, they can come and volunteer. So if between five and 11, they have to be with their parent, but at the age 12, they can be there on their own. And so a lot of times our orientation numbers are skewed a little bit because you know it's a parent coming with their child, but ultimately it ends up being like a really fun family you know, thing to do. Um, I've seen a lot of parents going through divorce that this is a way in which, you know, the kid, the kids and the parent are able to come and bond over, you know, this, this new activity. And so it's really neat. But after orientation, which is kind of just a, a learn a little bit more about Days End, get an idea of who, who we are, what we do, they do a tour, and then they schedule themselves at that point for two hands-on trainings. Um, and we didn't used to do that 
we started it a couple of years ago because we felt it would really help better prepare people for their sort of first full day. So the first hands-on training is a sort of a, it's a barn chore training. It, it shows people, you know, where tools are, how we clean stalls, um, the process of like where we scrub buckets, how we do things. And then the second uh, hands-on training is a uh, ground training. And so it's learning how we lead horses. And I know that sounds like so simple, but what we really try to do, because if you go back to that stressfulness of horses in this environment and you know constantly having different horses that they're around but also they have different people around them all the time and so we try to get everybody to lead the same way so holding the lead rope in the you know same position and you know it, you know not not wrapping it around their neck and you know things like that so we um we do a hands-on training shows them you know where our grooming tools are shows them you know how to groom if they've not groomed before because we are doing so many beginners um, and then after that, they are assigned the color pink. And this is because we're dealing with so many people, it helps us identify that this person's still a little bit new to the organization. So for their first 20 hours, they stay a pink volunteer. And that just means that their name tag has a pink sticker on it. And it quickly tells the staff that this person's still new to day's end. After their 20 hours, they're assigned a color. And that color helps, again, indicate very quickly to the staff what level of handling this person is prepared and capable of doing, which then correspondently has a horse that is assigned to it. So all horses have color tape on their halters, either green, yellow, or red, or purple. Um, the, the volunteers uh, are assigned then a corresponding color. So green obviously is for easy to handle, you know, really laid back uh, horses, although Let's be honest, all horses are unpredictable. So we do have that uh, caveat. Um, our yellows are just your more typical horse, a horse that, you know, you know, could easily just spook at somebody walking, you know, you know, past or unexpectedly. Reds are horses that need more experienced handlers. And our purples are our staff only. So that's any stallion, any baby, um, any horse that it is showing aggression or needs like very uh, regimented handling and training, they'll be assigned a purple color. So the goal isn't necessarily to always push a horse to the greens. I mean, sometimes it's just not realistic for some horses, but it's certainly to um, hopefully at least have as many greens and yellows as we can in the farm. So that's what our trainers will be working on. So at that point, volunteers use our online scheduler. They, they come in, we track hours, we, you know, they have appreciation events. They can join our volunteer Facebook, um, which it really, it really is a great community of people who share a passion for the organization and for horses. And I've seen so many volunteers develop just really meaningful friendships with not only other volunteers, but the staff. We've had a ton of volunteers end up adopting horses from day's end because they fall in love. Um, we've got a really cool program called Equidopt which allows people to have sort of um, a resemblance of supportive uh, care of a horse, but also the hands-on bonding time with a particular horse. So they can come in once a week and groom for an hour. And um, that allows people who might not want to commit fully to volunteering, but they just want to come for the like love and the cuddles and the, you know, uh, hands-on, you know, horse time. And so it allows them to provide a hundred dollar a month donation to supporting the care of the horse. And then they come on and they help give that uh, great bonding experience with the horse uh, once a week. Yeah, oh, very nice. Um, so this one's more of a fun question. What's been your favorite rescue rehabilitation story? Um, gosh, there's so many, but the one that's the most, one of the ones that's most memorable to me was my first one, I think. And maybe that's just, you know, how a lot of things work. But um, my first rescue was over in Allegheny County and community members had reported that this horse had been, they'd seen a, a trailer and it was a very remote area. So like neighbors would notice if there was like a truck in a trailer. Um, they saw it there like, you know, and it was in the dark, it was like around five o'clock in the morning. And then they started seeing this horse wandering around through the mountains. I mean, it was a very remote area. And it, so it, days later, you know, um, somebody had 
caught the horse in their barn and they called animal control and animal control caught us. And when we went and picked it up, it was a probably 20, 20 ish year old uh, off the track thoroughbred. And it was, it was skinny, but not super skinny, but definitely it had been clearly well handled. And, you know, you could tell it's, it had a life. It was, I mean, super it, going back to that color system. It was a green from the, from the, from, you know, go. Um, but it, it just was so crazy to me from coming from the, the horse show world to think of the method of getting rid of the horse was literally just to go drop it off in the middle of nowhere and thinking that the horse would just take care of itself. And so I just remember being so shocked by the fact that it wasn't, it was discarded. I mean, it genuinely was. And it was such an easy to handle horse. There was nothing about it that was difficult. So, you know, I couldn't imagine that somebody would have done that to some to an animal like that. Um, so I always remember that. So he was our, we had a naming system with our horses. Every year, we, the first horse that comes in, we, we uh, give it a name assigned with the letter A. We move through the alphabet, we get to double letters and triple letters, which is always really challenging. <laughs> um, and we never repeat the names. So he was our mountain man for the, he was our double M that year. So it was very fitting for him. So, oh, that's so yeah. Cute. yeah. So um, this, what, why do you keep coming back to your job? Like, why did you choose this? What is the one thing that keeps you coming back and keeps you loving this job? Um, it, it really comes down to the belief and passion for the mission of Day's End, um, inspiring, people to be compassionate about animals, uh, making a little bit of headway um, in, a, in a, a big problem in the country. Um, Maryland, you know, in particular is very well resourced. It's, you know, in my opinion, not a state that should be dealing with horses that are abused and neglected. We, you know, are obviously Maryland is a, is a huge horse state has a lot of resources. And so the fact that we continue to still bring in so many horses a year says that there's a lot more work to be done in this area. And, you know, that drives me to remain passionate about getting up every day and, and, and striving for uh, greatness for day's end. <laughs> it's an honorable cause. I, that was my last question. I don't know if you have any final remarks that you like Feel like you need to share but i really did enjoy learning about this <laughs> oh good no thanks so much and um i hope that anybody who sees this or that you are able to talk to um want to check us out so yeah well i hope you have a good day and you too thank you bye see you later.